Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of Dungeons and Dragons. Time to continue our, our never ending quest to learn of every kind of dragon. Today, the Clockwork Dragon. And for this one, I'm grabbing the latest offering from Kobold Press's Creature Codex. Though there have been other Clockwork Dragons listings, this is the most polished listing for 5th edition that I've found to date. If you happen to play Magic the Gathering, Clockwork Dragon is a gnarly card that can grow to epic proportions if you feed it a lot of mana, but the artifact creature itself is native to the unique planet called Muradin, which has now transformed into a necro-techno-organic nightmare ecology called New Phyrexia. In the usual lineup of D&D worlds though, Clockwork Dragons are constructed, not born, and they are superb examples of the complex art of Clockwork Automata. It takes a team of master artificers to construct even a, les a lesser form of this marvel of destruction. The components are not that difficult to come by, but the mastery and tools required makes these creations extremely rare. A few locations have more than their fair share of them however, such as the Clockwork Nirvana of Mechanis, though I should point out that Mechanis has its own native planner dragons. The world of Eberron also has a number of them thanks to the efforts of House Kenneth. During the last Great War there were uh, there might have been far more of these engines of mayhem if it were not um, as effective as they are because any facility where these weapons were being produced were top priority targets for the enemies of House Kenneth and also because constructing them was very labour intensive with a level of precision required that it precluded automated construction plants. Personally I love Clockwork Creek because they're not exactly a, mo a magical golem, they're not exactly a scientific marvel, they're a precision engineering and relative basic principles combined to a level way beyond anything on earth. In a way this makes them a technological wonder but in another way this makes them suitable for any setting no matter the level of magic within it. They're a fantastical creature, they're, they're, they're understandable, they're relatable, you can, you, can, you can grok how they work but of course they're way beyond anything that exists today. Clockwork Dragons are no mere machines though, they are war machines equivalent of a high performance supercar. They have sensory systems and triggering reflex mechanics so sensitive that without the combined control of several engineers, they simply kill any living thing within their area of engagement, which is a maximum of about 30 feet for the lesser version and 60 feet for the deluxe model. Control of them is managed by magical circlets that are worn by the engineers, though this could also be accomplished by specific sounds keyed to uh, the correct order and intensity on an instrument such as a metal xylophone, with each metal plate controlling a specific resonant membrane or guitar-like string in the clockwork control mechanisms themselves. The clockworks are so complex that the dragon is constantly rewinding and charging itself as it moves and it can remain relatively motionless for an almost indefinite length of time waiting for literally springing into action like they literally spring into action. The only thing that could run dry and need replenishment from an external source is the oil reservoir used for the dragon's breath weapon and internal lubrication. As mentioned they come in two versions. The lesser clockwork dragon is a large construct and has one head. The deluxe version has three heads and is of a huge size. So let's take a look at the stats on these engines of murder and start thinking and talking about the tactics that they would use in encounters. Also I'll talk about the ways to use these creations against much lower level party in a way that, that doesn't compromise how cool and threatening they are. First of all they are inorganic so they do not require food, water, air or sleep. They have no need um, to impact the local e ecosystem whatsoever. And so a clockwork dragon can exist in or arrive in a region with almost no telltale sign that it's there. The the only exceptions are sound, smell and its sheer size. This means a clockwork dragon could be transported into a city in parts and assembled in the sewer network. It could latch onto the bottom of a cargo or warship, even act as something of an engine for the vessel with wings and tail sweeping the water and propelling it along without aid of oar or sail, providing a secret advantage in manoeuvres and if need be, leaping out of the water suddenly, a secret super weapon to tear another ship and crew apart, emulating the sails and rigging, setting enemy ships ablaze. It could be that the clockwork mechanisms are vulnerable to water though, and it's quite likely that they're very vulnerable to extreme cold, slowing the entire thing down and rendering it unable to set its oil or tar spray on fire at all. Cold of course affects the uh, the malleability, the, the springiness and the the size of the precision parts, metal shrinks and expands in heat and cold, so it could actually 
be quite temp- temperature sensitive. It may be necessary to actually bathe metal parts in oil to preserve the temperature that they operate in. Um, so yeah, it could also be that the internal mechanisms assist its flight by filling bladders with lighter than air gases, compressing it and storing it again when it no longer needs to take to the air. This could leave it vulnerable to potentially blowing up if somebody were to score a critical piercing hit on it. If it's just flown, is a flying or is about to, and has just or is just about to use its flaming oil spray, it may be vulnerable to specific frequencies of sound, such as damaging sounds um, also have the effect of stunning or confusing it, or even making it lash out at random. Of course, as the Clockwork Dragon usually has these controllers, the form they form the uh, the Winkus Link in its defences as well, as a serious threat to them will obviously cause them to use the Dragon to defend themselves. The control circlets, if you choose to include them in your Clockwork Dragons, these are magical items that require attunement to use, they are activated when they're worn, and as long as the wearer is within a mile of the Dragon, they are in telepathic connection to it, with sensory signals overriding their own, as they can see and hear what the Dragon does. The the reasons they are there are three control circlets is that the process to bind to and command a dragon is extremely draining. With three controllers, the load is shared by all of them and can be used indefinitely. With only two that, that are wearing a circlet, they will suffer a level of exhaustion per hour of the dragons remaining active and operational. If only one person wears the control circlet and activates the dragons, they will suffer from one level of exhaustion per minute. And of course, if nobody has a circlet on and the dra- clockwork dragon is active anyway, it will attempt to kill anything it comes across and most likely devastate structures and anything it identifies as defenses or fortifications or important supplies and assets, including livestock and stores of food. This control interface and the potential drain it has on the operators is something you can certainly tweak quite a lot to really add a lot of dynamic potential to an encounter with these seriously dangerous machines. So just consider the many indirect ways that a smart player character party can defeat a clockwork dragon and let them benefit from taking those things and using them strategically rather than just relying on brute force. Reward players that think strategically. The standard clockwork dragon has an armor class of 16 and an average of 178 hit points. It stands 12 feet tall and moves at 30 feet on the ground or 50 feet in the air. It has nowhere near the agility of an actual living dragon, but is still as dexterous as your average human, even without the three controllers. It has merely adequate capacity to sense or make sense of what is going on around it, with a wisdom and intelligence score of 10 as well. However, it has a strength of 22 and a constitution of 20. It is totally immune to psychic or poison damage. It cannot be charmed, paralyzed, petrified, frightened, or exhausted. It will not fight with a regard for its own protection. It's a machine. And as a siege weapon, it inflicts double damage to all non-living structures and objects. It has 60-foot dark vision, senses granted at a passive perception of 16, and it has inherent resistance to magic, having advantage on all saving throws against it. Plus, it simply cannot be polymorphed, made gaseous or ethereal, shrugging off any magic that would force it to change its form. This is a good thing, as an astute player character will do something like uh, make the bridge underneath it turn to gas, causing the clockwork dragon to slam into the ground or water below. It's a little too clumsy to take flight and, um, to unexpectedly like that, so it just can't just burst into flight all of a sudden. It also means that the clockwork dragons can't be tra- transported um, at a magically reduced size once they're fully assembled and activated. You could have it so that any attempts to reduce or enlarge their size will release all the stored kinetic energy spring-loaded inside the machine and could cause it to effectively go off like a fragmentation bomb. Consider how difficult it is to make these devices though, and it's not something that the operators would ever cause to happen themselves on purpose unless it was they had absolutely no other option. In fact, it would be a tightly controlled military secret that this is um, the case at all. The physical attacks of even the smaller Clockwork Dragon are fearsome. It can spray a 30-foot jet of oil every single round, and will normally do so before making three physical strikes. The oil sprays are out in a cone, and each creature in the path of it must make a DC-16 dexterity saving throw or become vulnerable to fire damage until the end of the dragon's next turn. They become coated in highly flammable oil. I would also include that the area becomes difficult terrain if that oil happens to coat a hard, impermeable, smooth surface. Um, 
say, stone. But it depends on the terrain. I leave that up to you. The dragon could also ignite this oil spray itself, recharging its ignition spark on a roll of a 1d6. And if you get the number 6, you don't have to indicate that the players uh, to the players that the flamethrower has just reactivated. But I never seem to be able to, to keep the smirk off my face when it happens. And my players know exactly what that expression means in a dragon fight. I also tend to make dramatic inhaling sound effects and dragon breath noises as I point at which players need to make saving throws. When dragons breathe, players sweat dice rolls, my friends. And the more dire the consequences, the more arcane their, their dice superstitions become. If you're new to Dungeons & Dragons... Mark my words, it's entertaining to see how superstitious people can become about their character sheets, their dice rolls, and yeah, I've seen people who won't let anyone touch their dice. The flame attack has the same range and cone of effect, the same dexterity saving throws, but failure to save against it will inflict 10d6 damage, or an average of 35 hit points. Half as much even if you do manage to dive out of the way, just from the blistering heat wave. Also, keep in mind that the siege weapon effect also applies to the flame blast, which means it does dabble, double damage to normal objects and structures. Absolutely describe what that looks like to the players as they dance around the monster, because that really they'll think twice about trying the old hide behind a tower shield tactic, even though things like diving, uh, like diving behind a heavy oak door or behind a cart will get crossed off the list as the dragon just blasts the cart to smouldering bits and the players can see the lead pipes on building walls just melt before their very eyes. Town guards and metal breastplates could dive screaming into horse water troughs with their armour glowing cherry red from the heat, their hair and beards on fire, scorching hot weapons thrown aside, wooden pole arms and spear halves blazing like kindling. The dragon will either make a bite attack or a sweep with its tail as it pivots and snaps either end of its body around. They counterweight each other and the wings also hook onto walls or objects and pull it or anchor it as well. So the whole body is in motion, cogs and gears clicking, flywheels and pulleys whirring, springs stretching with pangs and pings, the pumping of oil and the loading of compressed air sounding very much like deep rumbles, growls and the dragon hissing. The sprays of oil or flame are followed by a roar of air being pumped into compression tanks rather than out of dragon lungs. So it makes a similar sort of a roaring sound except it's reversed. <laughs> Physical strikes are plus 9 to hit. The bite and tail sweep have a 10 foot reach, though the tail will hit anything in its path that fails a DC 17 dexterity saving throw. Remember, this tail hits with the dragon's full strength and a large, extraordinarily strong construct um, can send an object weighing over 600 pounds flying just about over 20, 20 feet. It will knock a squad of town guards around like they are bowling pins. Getting hit with a tail sweep does 2d8 plus 6 slashing damage, half as much even if you do make the dexterity save, though you might need to explain to me that bit as the monster st in the man monsters, I mean, it, I can't seem to see why the tail would hurt your character if you got out of the way, way of it with your saving throw. What do you think? Let me know in the comment section down below. The uh, bite attack does 2d10 plus 6 piercing damage, plus a decent scorch of 1d6 fire damage from the residual heat coming out of the oil spray igniter. The dragon, clockwork dragon tends not to have sharp blades on its limbs, so strikes from them are bludgeoning snap punches, restricted 5 foot melee range, and they do 2d6 plus 6 damage, which is still more than enough to punch right through your average townsfolk's chest or tear a head clean off their shoulders. Remember, average people are nowhere near as tough as adventurers. The deluxe clockwork dragons, as I call them, or simply the three-headed version, are huge in size, over 20 feet tall. These things are a challenge rating 14 compared to the challenge rating 8 of the smaller version. All of their tactics are the same, except it's bigger, stronger, faster, and has three bite attacks every round for a total of five attack actions. The armor class is 18, hit points average in at 275. It can fly at 60 feet or move on the ground at 40 feet. These dragons are probably lousy at climbing, given the complexity of doing that. The clockwork mechanisms just aren't up to the task. They're great weight and low dexterity, so they would take to the air to get over walls or snap into a glide if they topple off the top of a tower or something. The oil spray has the same range, but the flame effect is much more fearsome. They have three heads, and each of their fire streams is a 60-foot cone. The save DC is 19 for oil, oil or dexterity um, for their flame attacks as well. The flame does 13d6 damage, 
half on a successful saving throw, but objects and structures, because it's a siege engine, will take 26d6 damage from that. Probably enough to explode a decent chunk of stone wall out of a wizard tower or reduce a large catapult to a blazing bonfire. It will go through uh, the main tower defenses of a drawbridge or something like that. This is three cones of flame, so it's possible for the dragon to overlap them to hit targets from two different directions. When it does that, the victims save with disadvantage, but thankfully they don't take double damage, just the normal fire damage from one cone breath weapon. The extra strength and size of the uh, behind the tail sweep means that targets must make a DC 19 saving dexterity saving throw or take 2d8 plus 7 slashing damage and be knocked prone. I would say that either size of the dragon would knock you prone with that tail sweep. Let's get real here. But th- th- it would be a brutal hit, like getting hit with an industrial sized chain swung behind the back of a car doing a donut. Aside from being plus 12 to hit, the bite and fist attacks only do one extra point of damage, otherwise they're exactly the same. So there we have it, the Clockwork Dragon. In the Forgotten Realms, these would be left over in sealed workshop on the fallen Netherese Empire and de- buried below the Anorok Desert. They could be in old rusty war machines from the ancient empires in Masca, far to the east. They could be brand new techno horrors released from the mysterious foundries of the island of Lantan, or exotic treasures brought over as kingly gifts from the sultans of Kalimshan, or envoys from Karatur, or even more distant civilizations. They may be otherworldly contraptions acquired in the city of Doors, left cluttered up in a wizard's tower, the instruction manuals now an illegible pile of mold and mushrooms, just an activation switch without the safety precautions of those controls, uh, control circlets. I leave it up to you and your wild imagination. Just a reminder, if you've not subscribed or if you've been subscribed for a long time and have not watched a video from me in a while, it may help to unsub and resub again. Make sure you click the notification bell. You should see regular uploads from me every week, as well as two regular live upstr- uh, live streams, Wednesday and Saturday evenings for those of you who live in the States. Those who wish to explore the links in the description text under the video, you will see links to my Patreon. Anyone who donates at least a dollar per month gets access to all of the scripts that I write for these videos, as well as having special access to request content from me. I will research things for my patrons and often answer questions, such as the video on Iron Fang Keep. There may be a, uh, videos only patrons can see. There may be content released to patrons in advance of anyone else. And you get access to exclusive section on my Discord server. I am very, very grateful for the support from my patrons. Links to the merch for the channel. I will hopefully have some art prints available for you soon. Oh, and patron blades. I highly re- uh, recommend patron blades. I use them myself, myself for a mighty smooth shave. As always, thanks for listening. And I'll be back with more for you very soon.